Well, hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to this Insider's View. We're delighted to have Kent Marcus, uh, entertainment attorney, who is with us uh, on uh, Insider's View. And uh, the Nashville scene wrote about Kent. He has, uh, whether he likes it or not, not only he, has he got some great rock acts in there, but he also has uh, a, the uh, attention of being the go-to high-powered attorney for those braving the city's local rock trenches, as well as country. I don't know, that's pretty high-powered stuff, Kent, you know, to, yeah. to have that reputation. But people do think of you, uh, I guess because of your connection with Kings of Leon and other rock groups as kind of the rock attorney in Nashville. I suppose so. <laughs> how, did, how, did, how did your relationship with Kings of Leon come to be? Uh, by luck, initially. It was back in 2000, and uh, one of the bro uh, Nathan and Caleb, the two older brothers, uh -huh. I believe Caleb moved here with his mom, and then uh, Nathan moved here, and just by chance, the, uh, they were going to church in the summer of 2000. Uh -huh. And the air conditioning unit at the church blew. So the services for that night were canceled. And they decided to go to the Bluebird Cafe. They heard about the Bluebird. So they went there and saw this guy play guitar, who happened to be a good friend of mine and a client at the time. Uh -huh. And I suppose because of, um, call it being a bit naive, but having a lot of uh, courage and being quite brave, they just went up to him and said, hey, we need a guitar player. And or we write songs, and we need a guitar player. Because at the time, they didn't play any instruments. I think uh -huh. Nathan had played drums in the church. And uh, one of those moments where my friend could have said, like, are you, are you kidding me? You know, or he said, sure. And whether it was in the next day or so, they got together and wrote some songs, and my buddy called me and said, you got to meet these guys. You know, they're uh, incredibly gifted and talented. That was the start of it. And, um, you know, they just started writing songs. But that was, you know, because of a broken air conditioning unit and because of um, just by chance of meeting the right person at the right time, I'm a pretty lucky guy. Did you start out, did you want to be an entertainment lawyer when you started uh, your career? Um, well, I wanted to be, uh, I played bands all my life, so I wasn't sure if I wanted to take that path. Um, I kind of lost my itch for playing, and then I got into television, uh -huh. and I uh, worked in Chicago for uh, Telepictures, which is a Warner Brothers company, and working on um, quality daytime talk shows, and uh, that spurred my interest into law school. So I went to law school thinking that I was going to go back into television and uh, just didn't, uh, never lost my itch. Well, I lost my itch for playing music, but I right. never lost my itch right. for just loving music. And uh, there was the moment, uh, my own personal moment, I was at a Black Crows concert in Philadelphia. And it just, you know, the ceiling parted, skies parted, and I knew that I wanted to continue the course of um, entertainment, entertainment law, but focusing on music. So that the, the, a, a little bit of an adjustment for that path. Was it television that drew you to Nashville or, or the entertainment scene? It was, um, well, it was a job, actually. <laughs> um, I finished law school, and um, because I didn't follow the traditional path of First year law school, then you work as a summer associate at some law firm. Uh, my first summer, I worked at an independent record company called War Records in Boulder, Colorado. And then my second summer, I worked for EMI Records in New York. And then after I graduated, I didn't have a job. I didn't, I didn't set it up to yeah. have where the offer from the big corporate firm in the middle of my third year, so I was set. I actually was working at a record store after I graduated <laughs> law school. And uh, through connections and friendships, I knew some people at Capricorn Records, which at the time they're based, they were based in Nashville, right. and made some phone calls. And one day, the uh, general manager said, hey, if you want a job, come down to Nashville. So I packed up the car and moved to Nashville. That was in 
uh, November of 96. So, so your first experience in Nashville was working with Capricorn yes. Records. Correct. And doing that. You know, in terms of your career, you've done some pretty interesting things, and, and we hear a lot now, and, and it's almost kind of become, or is becoming the norm, the 360 deal for artists and, and labels. And you engineered one of the first, I guess, 360 deals. So talk about that and, and, and that concept and, and, and how you went in that direction. Well, first, it, it's, it's not such a novel idea. I, I, Barry Gordy, Gordy did it back in the Motown days, where it kept everything in-house. Uh, the, obviously, the recording rights, merch, uh, songwriters were, were in-house. And it was, uh, I don't remember the year, uh, there was a, another young rock band that we were working with. And uh, I would guess 2003 or four. And uh, the gentleman named Lior Cohn, who at the time was running Island Def Jam. And he's now the chairman or just the, the head of the Warner Music Group North America. But at the time he was at Island Def Jam, and he came to us and asked if we were interested in being partners. And that, that, that partnership was the modern day 360 deal, or at least the, um, the reinvention uh -huh. of that. Um, and at the time, it just was crazy to think that an artist would share uh, touring revenue and uh, merch revenue with the label. Um, and so we just declined, moved on. Then with Haley Williams and Paramore, they were signed to Atlantic. Actually, Haley was signed to Atlantic. And Lior, uh, whatever his title was at, at the time, but still high up at the Atlantic or the Warner Music Group. Yep. Uh -huh. And uh, the president of Atlanta was a guy named Jason Flom, and they brought that idea back. So, um, for whatever reason, it just seemed, um, it was a warmer idea, or, or at least we were more receptive to it for a lot of reasons. Um, the manager at the time, and um, we, I, I was, us as lawyers, it, the, the creative nature of the deal, the, I would say even the, the foundation, the philosophy, the spirit of the deal um, was pretty interesting for a really young artist to encourage investment, to encourage patience. On the label side, this seemed to make sense. There was a, um, a financial commitment, um, a, uh, we'll call it a release commitment. It was, hey, let's, let's they didn't really use partners, <laughs> that yeah. word, but uh -huh. they, they try to use it. But um, to incentivize the long-term development and commitment for this artist to give the label a, a fair return on their investment, uh, again, as a foundation, seemed sure. to make sense. It felt okay. Um, you know, and, and 360 still has a bit of a negative um, connotation nowadays, but at the time, it seemed fair. Uh, that was in, uh, I think Haley was signed in 2003. In 2004, we renegotiated the deal to make it a 360 deal. Right. It wasn't in the same form that it's in today. And because the deal didn't exist, uh, myself and the team at Atlantic just started drafting the deal. <laughs> and uh, obviously there were a lot of holes and flaws in the deal because it was the first of its kind. But um, you know, trying to create a model uh, that would um, benefit the artist and also benefit the label. It was just that uh, the record sales were starting to decline. So it was a means to offset the declining income on the record side of things. Um, so that, again, the, the goal is to um, create a return that's commensurate to the investment. So that spirit seems fair, and that's how the whole deal sort of yeah, started. Yeah, because initially the, the label has such a big investment in the artist. Uh, that it's, does, it, does it benefit a 360 more to the label or the artist? Depends on who you ask. <laughs> um, 
the um, the thing about the 360 deal, Paramore is probably, and um, they, they hate to be tagged with this, but they're sort of the poster band because they're probably one of the only successful bands. So it's, you know, I, I don't want to dismiss the, uh, the negotiation and the creation of the deal, but a lot of it almost doesn't matter. Yeah. So I'm not sure who it benefits. I would say that there, there's really not much life in those other income streams early on. So is the label making money now? Are they getting a return on their investment? Most likely not. Um, so maybe it's benefiting the artist that they're at least getting um, the support early on from the label. Yeah. They're getting a shot um, if it was based solely on, if, if the return on income was based solely on record sales, probably a lot of these bands would be um, cut loose sooner. Yeah. How do you go about so, uh, war selecting the artist you work with? Hmm. Um, it, it, uh, the lawyer answer is it depends. <laughs> um, you know, to, in building a business model, representing young artists isn't the smartest thing because most young artists don't make any money. So the, um, fortunately, I have some, some blue chippers that allow me to uh, spend some time with those uh, young artist clients. And so with that, it's a, it's a gut. You know, I mean, I, I don't claim to know what, what a successful artist is, but some, you know, when you, when you work with a lot of artists, I think it's easier to recognize the, uh, the true hunger and the true uh, spirit. There's a separation. You know, you can recognize the artist that has it, and that's kind of lame to say, but that has it, or that you just know this is what they do. And so I'm going to risk, and I'm going to make the investment with those artists. If someone walks in my office with a deal in hand, yeah. I'll do it, you yeah. know, and I'll do a great job. But as far as the clients where not much is going on, but I'm going to, you know, work for nothing for a long time, it needs to be something truly special, and it, that's kind of hard to define or yeah. qualify. What has uh, surprised you about the success of Kings of Leon? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised every time I see them play. It's, it's because I've known them for so long. It's very surreal like to hang out with them off stage. They're the guys I've always known. To see them on stage playing for... Uh, stadiums or, you know, at um, you know, festivals where you have hundreds of thousands of people, it's still a disconnect for me. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's, I, 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 don't think, I, don't, I don't think I'm surprised. I mean, it's been a 10-year a career for them, and it's one of those things where the, the, the progression, the steps are small, 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 and then all of a sudden, you're, you know, you're, you're on right. album five, and the difference between album one and album five, it's so significant, you know, but you don't really recognize it as it's happening. They are, uh, when I moved to Nashville, I mean, I, I, I don't know if um, I really understood what it meant to be blessed or to have gifts, and those guys, you know, they don't, I don't know if they really get credit for it still, but they are truly um, blessed and have gifts um, that, um, you know, obviously it's, it's an anomaly. You know, for every one Kings of Leon, there's 5,000 other bands. So um, I'm not surprised at their success. Um, uh, it just, it always felt like a very easy, natural progression for them. Yeah, yeah the European. Uh, success, I think we were talking earlier, that is, is the thing that's really big for yeah. them. I mean, maybe that's surprising to see these guys that you know, have known for 11, 12 years uh -huh. play for 65, 75,000 people and just kill it. 
Um, again, I'm not surprised, but that's always just, it just blows me away. And no offense to the U.S. crowds, but the European crowds are just crazy. They're, they're amazing. Yeah. How is, how is it different from representing an act like Kings of Leon, highly successful, to an emerging act that's just getting their legs? And I think the, the, uh, the issues that I deal with are the same. I mean, there, it's you know, intellectual property, copyrights, things like that. It's just at a different level. You know, a record deal for a young artist and a record deal or renegotiating a record deal for a successful artist, the, the same issues are there, um, just at a different level. Uh -huh. um, there's obviously a tremendous amount of work, and there's more work with the successful artist because whether it's um, just dealing with licensing issues and um, you know, publishing, recording, to looking at a bus lease or a, um, a charter agreement for a plane or something like that right. that a young artist wouldn't have. But the, um, my mindset is still similar. You know, the just, you know, my eyes have been affected by what I do, so when I'm reading a contract, it's, I'm, I'm you know, my, 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 my brain has been pretty skewed. Yeah. Uh, so when I'm reading something, you know, I'm just looking for the same uh, issues and negotiating the, the same points. I know that I'm not gonna get what I'm getting over here, yeah. um, but at least it's still an issue that, that I recognize. Yeah, and I, and I suppose having that experience with a group like Kings of Leon and that success kind of opens your eyes to what you need to look for in this emerging act down the road for them. Absolutely. There's probably uh, nothing that I haven't, well, I shouldn't say that. Um, I've, I've seen uh, most things come across my desk representing a very successful band like that. Um, you know, you, you learn every day, so I'm sure there's something that I haven't seen, but um, it's definitely... Uh, Along with just time, it's given me an incredible amount of experience that you know probably most um, most entertainment lawyers maybe don't have only because working with an artist at that level um, you know you're you're in a different league um, the artist is in a different league I'm just following along, but the um, the the rooms change I'm sitting in a different room with them. Right. You know, which just um, opens your eyes to things and you learn more. Um, you know, you're exposed to things that I would never be exposed to with an emerging artist. And that's just given me, I'm very thankful for it, that's given me the, um, just a great amount of experience. Yeah. Nashville, obviously, is, is the country music capital of the world. Is it any different for working with the country artists you work with than, than the rock artist? Um, Again, the, the fundamental issues are the same. I think it's the way the industry, the industries are different. Um, even in, in contracts, um, doing a contract, or doing a record deal for, let's say, um, uh, Universal Show Dog here in Nashville, or a Big Machine, or a Broken Bow, or even a Warner Nashville, those companies here, and doing a, a deal for uh, Atlantic out of New York, the, the business is, is, is different. I'm not saying better or worse, it's just different. Um, the issues are the same, but the, it just, it's treated differently. Nashville may not be as concerned with X as much as New York or LA is concerned with X, and vice versa. New York may not be concerned. Um, publishing is, is a big example where Nashville and just to use an ex as an example, the Nashville record companies are much more understanding uh, and, and open to uh, publishing issues. And um, uh, they give most artists, I would say, more favorable publishing terms in the record deal, like uh, control composition, mechanical royalty provisions, right. things like that. Right. Where on the rock side, they, they're not as um, appreciative of the publishing world that we live in here in Nashville. Everything seems to be here, more and more independent artists 
as opposed to label art. Is, is this true universally? Is that just true of what's happening in, in the Nashville music community? I would say globally, it's uh, much more of an indie world, for yeah. sure, which uh, to me is very exciting. Where you, I mean, there's a lot of artists. I mean, there's, you know, any, any new artist can be an independent artist, but um, from an industry perspective, it's definitely an independent world. And the, um, you know, the Nashville or the country music industry, pound for pound, it's a very strong industry. But in terms of the number of labels, obviously it's a smaller number here than in New York and LA on just the non-country side of things. Um, but proportionally, it's, um, you know, it's, it's more difficult I think in country to be an independent label because still the primary means of marketing country music is still radio. So you need to have the horses to, um, to create that, you know, to get on the radio. Right. And so the independent, I, I think, and I'm, you know, I, I, I don't um, run a record company, my, but from my seat, it, it seems like it's difficult for an independent label to compete with the, uh, the big dogs, you know, to get their artists and those songs on radio. But, you know, you look at Broken Bow, they've done a, I mean, that, yeah. I don't, they're considered to be an independent label, um, but, you know, it, it didn't take much for one of their artists to have an incredible amount of success. Um, to prove that, hey, it definitely can be done, you know, with the right artists and the right songs. Um, it still takes a lot of cash, you know, to uh, support that artist, uh, but it can be done. Yeah. So proportionally, it's just on a much smaller level here. Yeah. The muscle is there behind this, the Sonys yes. of the world. Yes. Muscle, yeah. relationships, you know, yeah. cash. So if, if an independent artist is starting their own label, I mean, obviously, they're going to need a lot of help someone like how do you how do you work with that artist that's starting his own or someone who's come out of a uh, a major label and and working his own obviously they they need a lot of i would think help yeah i mean it, it really depends on the situation and what the goals are of the client yeah and i'm there to just support the goals and to counsel them it all depends um I need to be very careful. I try to be very careful with the hat that I wear. I'm a lawyer, first and foremost. I'm not a manager. So hopefully there's management in place. Uh, they, they handle the day-to-day -day, uh, operations of that business. And so, you know, I'm there just to hopefully facilitate the goals. Um, so it really all depends. I mean, there's, it, it, it's, there's no uh, set course, obviously, because each right. artist is different and each right. um, scenario is different. Um, if there's, you know, a, a young artist, I mean, I love the fact that it's an independent world and you can, for a young artist, you can do, you can accomplish a lot on your own. If you are more of a pop artist and, hey, you know, you want to get on the radio and sell a million records, well, that's going to affect maybe my counsel because it's like, all right, well, you, if you're a rock band, you're not going to be or you, you're telling me you don't want to be in a van, you know, playing bar to bar, club to club. Right. So if, if I do believe in that artist, then it's like, all right, well, we need to go this way. And just based on my experience and my relationships, okay, I can help counsel them to achieve their goals over here. Um, and with a successful artist, same thing. All right, well, you're out of this label. What do you want to do? Are you in a situation now where you can do it on your own? You can own your, your, your masters and you can own your publishing and... Um, you know, we could start our own label and let's maybe outsource a publicist or independent radio promotion. Yeah. They may say, you know what, that all sounds great, but you know what, I, I don't want to deal with that headache and that mess. Um, let's just go find another deal. Yeah. So that would affect right. my counsel at that point. Obviously, it, there's, it has to be a team around there. And you touched on this a little bit, but, but the relationship between management and you as, as an attorney and, and how all that works. Yeah, it sounds cliche, but the, the team is essential. And 
it's important to have checks and balances, uh, but there, it needs to be done in a very supportive sense. Um, I, I, I'm obviously, I'm spoiled in my experience having worked with amazing teams. Um, I've worked with amazing management. Uh, basically, you know, you've got a manager, a lawyer, a booking agent, and a business manager is kind of the internal team. Um, and then there's obviously some support, whether it's a publicist or something right. like that. Um, you have to work together. And um, like I was saying before, I, I try to be very careful of knowing my role. I'm not a manager. I don't want to be a manager. Right. Uh, I think what I can offer, uh, and what my firm can offer is we do a little bit more than paper pushing. I mean, you know, I, I think because of our experience, we can help um, contribute to the discussion at hand um, if it's the right time and right place. You know, working with great management, you know, then we really know our roles. They handle this, I handle that, and it's a pretty smooth machine right. at that point. Um, but for me, if that team isn't there, and if there's the, the one uh, team member, um, you know, maybe the rotten apple, or the one that is um, not contributing or in, in some way is creating a, a, a negative uh, vibe, for lack of a better word, and, and you know, someone that's a bit insecure and all of a sudden starting to throw other people under the bus, for me, I'm gone. I won't. I won't be in that situation because it just is a, um, it's a rotten situation. Yeah. What are some of the emerging issues uh, that artists need to be looking out for? Well, it's, um, it's a little bit out of the artist's control in the sense that the, 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 the means the, of consuming music has obviously changed. And it's, um, and, my, and my, my kind of, my philosophy, my um, sort of um, model of representation is um, I've, I always wanted to be on the forefront of the wave as opposed to missing the wave or being behind the wave yeah. or being slammed with the wave. Right. And in the, the 360 deal, it was part of it. It's like, all right, this is where it's going. I'd rather be involved in helping define and develop that, 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 it's not a trend, but that right. new model. model. So nowadays with you know, technology and with um, the, again, it's, it's the, the way music is consumed has changed so much. Um, you know, Spotify, the digital streaming, everyone has their different opinions of, of how, you know, is Spotify gonna work or is the streaming service in general going to completely take over the digital download business. Um, so, you know, as an artist, it's, you want to be aware of that, but it's also, I, I don't know, it, it's, it's a revolution of sorts or an evolution of sorts uh -huh. of, of the way music is made and the way music is distributed. So I think you just need to be cognizant of that and with that comes, it's a large, it's a huge market. And so knowing that, if, if I'm an artist, I mean, you just need to adjust your goals. You need to have realistic expectations. Um, you know, the, you're not gonna make a ton of, mu ton of money selling music. So, you know, how do you, it's marketing 101, it's economics 101, you know, how, supply and demand. The, supply side, the distribution is almost worthless unless there's a demand. So demand, how do I get my music to the right people? So, you know, if I'm a new artist, I'm not so concerned about the legal issues so much. It's more of just the, um, the industry in, in itself and how is it growing, how is it changing, right. and how can I uh, be successful in the midst of this and how can evolution. I be a voice among thousands? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Talk a little bit about the intersection of the music industry as it relates and in, in what you deal with, and it relates to movies, television, um, gaming, and how that is 
emerging? Because that's a big part of sure. the business now. There was a, um, I've kn I can't remember the year, uh, a great book uh, called Madison and Vine. I think it was published maybe 15 years ago, if not more, um, about the convergence of Madison Avenue, the advertising industry, and Vine, the entertainment industry, and how it comes down to marketing where the advertisers, and with TiVo or video on demand, right. the advertisers needed content to bring people to their product. The music industry, to be specific, needed a stronger means of marketing music. So with that, I think now with, with games and the licensing world, I think, has become much more significant than it, than it was. And it, it comes down to, again, it's another means of marketing music. Uh, syncs and getting music in film and television and in games, you know, it's a significant way to create income, to create awareness. Um, and, you know, different artists have different takes on it. And I don't, I don't know if it's a matter of integrity, but some artists say, you know, I don't want to sell out. I don't want to be identified with a brand. Some artists say, look, uh, you know, I don't mind, you know, if it's the right brand and this whole idea of co-branding, if it's the right brand, I'd rather take it this way than throwing something out there and just hoping that someone finds it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I had a meeting yesterday with a client and uh, a shoe company, <laughs> you know, they, they wanted them, they wanted to be involved in the band's business. And it was a really interesting conversation, the young band. And, you know, from one side of the table is talking about this could be really cool and we could use this um, to our advantage, maybe, you know, online, you know, with this cool shoe company um, to have our music there and, and to use that. And the other side of the table is, you know what, we don't want to be identified with this particular brand of shoes. So it's, um, the opportunities are there. And I guess the difference is how the particular artists are going to take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah. Talking with someone yesterday who had negotiated a deal with Flip Video, and, and their music was used there. Are these long-term deals? I mean, obviously, something like that would be kind of, I would think, a long-term deal. And how do you work that out as opposed to something that's short-term and renewed? Uh, again, it depends. It depends on, on, on the deal. Most of those types, um, whether well, you can call it an endorsement or a sponsorship yeah, type right. deal or a co-branding, a, 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 a trademark licensing type right. of a deal. Uh, they're usually not long-term. The effect may be long-term, but usually it's, um, you know, flip or uh, people are, are pretty aware of the uh, Apple ads right. um, where, you know, it's usually just a run, um, a, um, whether it's a year, the, the term, it can be defined in different right. ways, but... And that's um, up to you to determine yeah, how Yeah, and, and usually it's um, uh, based on a certain amount of time or certain triggering events, but they're usually pretty short term. The content that may be created during this period, that can go on and on and on. Yeah. And obviously the effect, positively or negatively, can go on and on and on. A great example is that band Jet, and they did um, uh, an, an ad with Apple, and it was just so overplayed and overplayed, it probably killed the band. So you need to be very careful about exactly. the term and the relationship and how long is that relationship going to go on. And, and after the exact term is over, what can that particular brand do with the content? You know, I mean, things move pretty quickly, so, you know, I doubt Apple would use that Jet song now, um, but it's... Um, yeah, part of what I need to look out for and how I yeah. protect my artists and you must be very careful and I probably want that, re I was going to say I, I want that relationship to be sh very short, but you never know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not opposed to a long-term relationship where you can build something with the brand and that brand could almost become a label of sorts where they're funding it. They are the marketing tool. Record labels now are marketing companies. Yeah. You know, money, distribution, marketing and promotion. Distribution really can pull that out of the mix too because you can distribute your own 
music. Right. It's kind of a good news, bad news thing, and especially uh, in thinking of gaming, it's a great way to break your music. But uh, how do you? Yeah, I mean, it. it um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bank on it. Uh, the deals. It depends. There's there's such a, a a huge spectrum of types of games and how the licensing works, whether it's Guitar Hero or some smaller video game. Um, so it's it's kind of hard to uh, f figure out, you know, how, how that the obviously there's an interaction, but yeah. sometimes it's kind of worthless. Sometimes maybe you just want to take a check to uh, sync your music, and nobody's going to see it, so who cares? Um, so it really depends on the situation, the 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 leverage of the game, you know, and and you know, I, I'm not really sure if even the most powerful games uh, have a long-term effect. Kind of remains to be seen. Yeah. What are some questions um, that our students who are going to be artists? What are some of the things they need to be asking uh, when they go to, to look for someone like you as an as an entertainment attorney for them? Um, uh, sometimes I'm doing the asking. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's kind of a uh, the interview goes both ways? Right. You know, do I want to work with this right. artist? Do they have that hunger and dedication that I'm looking for? Um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of really good lawyers. Nashville, New York, LA. And depending on the genre of music that you're in, it's country, pop, rock, metal, urban, whatever, yeah. uh, I'd want an attorney that's very experienced in that genre. You know, I mean, it's the paperwork is one thing, the relationships are another thing, um, where I can knock out the best record deal. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but when things, when things go great or things go awry, it comes down to the relationships and knowing the people and being able to call someone and say, look, this isn't working, how do we fix it? So I think it's um, questioning the experience of the attorney um, questioning the relationships of the attorney, um, you know, looking at the, the clients, uh, you know, that the attorney, but, you know, but um, kind of going back to what you first were talking about, you know, I, I think I'm a pretty good attorney and I don't really like to be tagged as the rock guy because you know what, I'm in Nashville and I have a handful of really great country artists right. and I think my work product is, you know, just as, as great. So, um, you know, to be, uh, yeah, I'm now contradicting, contradicting myself because I don't want to say, you know, oh, well, you need to find a genre-specific attorney because that's not necessarily fair. It's a fit. It's a trust. You want to trust your attorney. So it's, um, maybe it just comes down to that. I mean, the experience is going to be there. The track record, the credibility, the relationships, the reputation is going to be there. Sometimes it comes down to a fit. I like this person better than I like this person. Right. Well, on the flip side of that, how does someone become you? What are the skills that someone would need to, to be an entertainment attorney? I mean, I have a weird um, thought or response to that because through my progressions, it was, it was always, um, it was a natural progression. Uh -huh. It just seemed and felt right. So it was easy for me. Um, like I was telling you, you know, when I went to law school, um, I had a mentor when I was working in television that was a lawyer, and that spurred my interest to go to law school. And then just the things happening with, you know, the Black Crows concert, whatever, it just, it, it, it was a, it was easy, and it felt right, and I loved it. So the, I'll, I'll say two things. One, for any job, you got to love what you do, because you probably work more in your life than you do anything else. Yeah. You gotta love it. You know, when I wake up, I know it sounds kind of cheesy, but when I wake up, I'm excited to go to work, you know, most of the time. Um, and then the other thing, along with the, the love, would be the experience. Um, and again, this is just based on my own personal experiences, but eventually knowing that I wanted to be in entertainment or being an entertainment attorney, um, I just, I, I, had to take advantage of certain experiences. 
working at, um, some people may disagree, but if I chose to work at some corporate or um, different type of law firm, where's that going to get me? Right. So the experiences that I had of working at record companies, working at publishing companies, uh, internships, you know, where I just wanted to get in there. I worked at record stores. Yeah. That gave me the experience to just know the industry and get a feel for the industry. And I immersed myself in the industry, and I think that made me a better lawyer. And now being on the other side of the desk of, you know, meeting people and, and interviewing, um, you know, <laughs> I don't want to give anyone a, a bad idea, but you know what? I don't care about the grade point average. I don't. I want to know what, you know, what experience you've had, um, who you've worked for, um, and just, you know, do you, do you love it? Um, and for me, it's kind of funny, you know, I mean, if you're, you know, I don't care about coming in and you got, like, the suit and tie and all, like, the resume and all that. For me, I don't need that. So if you want to be an entertainment lawyer, you know, I mean, you know, you want to, you want to be professional. Yeah, I'm not sure. saying come in and just, you know, T-shirt and jeans, even though I usually wear right. a T-shirt and jeans. But <laughs> it's that experience, the love and the experience, I think, are the um, two most important elements. Can't overlook passion, can you? No. Yeah. Ken Marcus, thank you very much. We appreciate you being Thanks, our Eric. guest on Insider's View. Thank Ken you. Marcus, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs>